Welcome to Harvard Applied Math 205, a graduate course in scientific computing and numerical methods. In this video we're going to look at piecewise polynomial interpolation. We're going to look at how to compute splines and we'll look at several programming examples and also some analytical calculations. So in the previous videos we've looked at several different methods for doing polynomial interpolation and we've seen a number of effective choices such as Chebyshev interpolation that works well across a broad range of functions. But we don't always have the freedom to choose our points to be Chebyshev distributed. And here we're going to look at an alternative interpolation method called piecewise polynomial interpolation. And the idea here is simple. We take our domain and divide it up into subdomains and we do polynomial interpolation on each one. And here we use the term that the interpolation points are called knots. And we've already seen one example of this earlier on. I showed you this example where we could take a number of discrete points and we could construct a piecewise linear interpolation that we can also refer to as a linear spline, where between every pair of data points we just, we just introduce a linear function. So with piecewise polynomials, we can often work with lower order polynomials and that can avoid some of the difficulties with higher order polynomials that we sometimes get with Runge's phenomenon and blow up. However, one issue with lower order polynomials is that we often would lose some smoothness. And we saw that in the linear spline example. There, every time we cross over a data point, we actually have a loss of differentiability. And in addition, one benefit of the Chebyshev approximation scheme was that we could actually achieve exponential convergence to a function. Whereas here, when we're dealing with lower order polynomials, we would typically get algebraic convergence. So splines are a popular type of piecewise polynomial interpolant. And in general, a spline of degree k is a piecewise polynomial that is continuously differentiable k minus 1 times. And splines solve that loss of smoothness issue by ensuring that we have a number of continuous derivatives and therefore we can often construct functions that retain a certain degree of smoothness. And Splines are actually very popular in certain areas. In particular, they're widespread in computer-aided design using software such as, for example, AutoCAD or SolidWorks. And they're also used a lot in vector graphics or also with font design. And the term spline actually comes from a shipbuilding tool that was used to draw smooth curves by hand. And in this section, we're going to focus on the cubic spline although the ideas can really generalize to splines of other degree. And for a cubic spline, we're interested in a function that is in second differentiable over an interval from a to b. And it will have continuous second derivatives and therefore it often looks very smooth to the eye. And if we take this set of data points that we were looking at from before and construct a cubic spline through them, then we actually end up with a very smooth curve. So suppose that we have knots at positions x0, x1, up to xn. So that gives us n separate intervals from xi minus 1 to xi. And in each one of those intervals, we're going to define a cubic with four parameters. And that will therefore give us four n parameters in total. And so we now need equations that allow us to set those parameters. So we'll have a number of data points here. So we'll have data points from f0 up to fn. And the first thing that we require is that our piecewise polynomials should match the given data points. And if we look at every individual interval, our cubic in the interval must, must match the data points at either end. And that therefore gives us two equations per interval, and therefore two n equations in total. Now, if we look at maintaining that the first derivative is continuous, then 
we can look at all of the interior intervals over our range from x1 up to xn minus 1. And that will therefore give us another n minus 1 equations. And we can do the same thing for the second derivatives. So that will give us another n minus 1 equations. So here then, we have 4n parameters describing our cubics, and we've got 4n minus 1 equations in total. So we see that we're short two conditions, and there are several different approaches that people take to apply two additional constraints. One approach is the natural spline, and here we enforce that our cubics must have zero second derivative at either end of our interval, at x0 and at xn. Another approach is the not to not spline, and here, at x1 and xn minus 1, the first interior boundaries from either end, we enforce that the third derivative also matches. And now those boundaries, x1 and xn minus 1, we've enforced that all derivatives match up to third order. And because of that, we've actually defined that we have the same cubic in the region from x0 up to x2 and xn minus 2 up to xn. So effectively that knot disappears and we have actually the same cubic over an interval of double width. There are other approaches you can do as well, such as for example if you have a periodic domain then you might do something different. So we'll now look at a few examples. So many libraries actually have functions that can compute splines and they also often have different ways that we can specify these additional conditions. And we'll look at two examples now, spline.py and spline2.py. We'll now look at two example programs that demonstrate Python's routines for calculating splines. And in this first example, spline.py, we're going to demonstrate the interp1d function that you can find within the scipy.interpolate module. So we're going to look at finding two splines, x as a function of t, for two sets of similar data points. And for our t values, we're going to make use of six values that are linearly spaced over the range from 0 to 5. And our x values will be 0, 2, 0, minus 4, 0, and 6. And we'll also look at this variant set of values where we adjust the 2 here to 2.1. So we'll now create the spline by calling the interp1d function. And we'll pass it our t and x values. And we'll give it this, this additional option of kind equal cubic, which returns a cubic spline. And this will use the natural boundary conditions. So we'll also make a call to interp1d to calculate our variance spline using the variance set of data points. And both of these functions will return back these objects f and f2 that we can use to evaluate the splines at any particular value of t. So now we'll create a linearly spaced grid of points over the interval from 0 to 5 and we'll then use that to plot both sets of data and both splines on the same axes. And so if you run this program, then we see that both splines smoothly fit the data points that, that we provided. We can see that there's a small adjustment to the splines uh, when the point was moved at t equal 1, but overall we have very smooth curves. So we might ask ourselves, when we move this point, how much has the spline actually changed? And to investigate this, I'm going to make use of this commented outline here to plot the difference between f and f2. So let me run this again, and this will now plot the difference. And we'll see here that when t equal 1, we have a difference of minus 0.1 due to the data point that was moved. But we'll also see that there's a 
noticeable difference between the two splines throughout the entire interval of T. And this is really a characteristic of splines. When we construct splines, we're enforcing that the first and second derivatives match at every interval boundary. And because of these conditions, we actually find that the cubics in each interval are tightly coupled together. And this means that if we make an adjustment to one data point, that can actually lead to a non-local alteration in the spline throughout the entire interval that the spline is defined on. So we'll now move to look at a second example of spline 2.pi. And here we're going to look at using the interp1d function to plot parametric curves with splines. So we'll now calculate the same spline as before, our spline x as a function of t, using the same data points as before. But we'll now introduce a second set of data points, y, that takes on values of 1, 0, minus 3, 0, 5, and 0. And we'll actually construct two sets of splines for these x and y values. We'll first construct f and g, calling the interp1d function. But here we'll omit the kind equal cubic option, and this will return back a linear spline. We'll also then calculate a cubic spline, and we'll store that in F2 and G2 for the X and Y components, respectively. So we'll now make a parametric plot of the results. So in the XY space, we'll plot our curves. And we'll plot both the linear spline and the cubic spline on the same axes. and we get the following plot shown here. So we see that our data points are shown in blue and the linear spline just connects these data points using linear segments. But the cubic spline gives us now a smooth curve in the plane that connects all of these segments together. And this is really very useful for many different types of applications, particularly, for example, in computer-aided design, where we could use curves like this to represent smooth curves in some design that we were creating. So we're now going to consider an explicit calculation of a cubic spline. And while we typically solve splines numerically, here we're going to consider a simple example that we can solve analytically. And this can help us build intuition about exactly how splines work. So we'll look at constructing a cubic spline s of x over the interval from 0 to 2 through the three points 0, 0, 1, 0, and 2, 1. And we'll therefore need to calculate two splines over the intervals from 0 to 1 and 1 to 2. And we could use a monomial basis and write each cubic in the form ax cubed plus bx squared plus cx plus d, and then solve for the coefficients. But here we're going to take a different approach, and we're going to use an alternative basis that's made of functions c0 of x, c1 of x, c2 of x, and c3 of x. And these functions span the same space as the monomials, and we can construct any cubic in terms of a linear combination of these four functions. But I've chosen these functions because they have nice properties on their function values and derivatives that make them particularly well suited for satisfying the spline constraints. So we'll now take a look at these functions on the computer. So here I've started GNU plot in a terminal and I've set the x label to be x, I've set the key to be in the top center, and I've then defined these four cubic functions. And here I'm now going to plot these over the interval from zero to one, and we'll take a look at what they look like. So we can see then that they have very nice properties on the function values and the derivatives at zero and one. And so if you look first at c zero of x, then it is zero, at 0, and it's 1 at 1, and the derivative vanishes at both 0 and 1. If we look at c1 of x, then we see that it is 0 at 0, and 0 at 1, but, and it has vanishing derivative at 0, and a derivative 1 at 1. And so we can actually find then that these four functions have 
these properties on their function values and derivatives are these two endpoints. And so each one of them has achieves a value of one in one of these four properties and achieves a value of zero in all of the other ones. And so since splines involve setting function values and derivatives across boundaries, these, these properties are very helpful for, for us to have. You also notice here that in this plot we have some symmetries here. So C0 and C3 are mirror images of one another and C1 and C2 are mirror images of one another but with, also with a sign flip. So I've now replotted these functions that we saw in GNU plot here. And as we saw, these functions have nice properties on their function values and derivatives at x equals 0 and 1. And specifically, if we look at the four properties of ci of 1, ci prime of 1, ci prime of 0, and ci of 0, then we find that in each of these properties, each function achieves a value of 1 for one of the properties and 0 for all the rest. And these properties will really help us when we come to construct the spline. So now we'll go ahead and calculate the second derivatives of our basis functions. And we'll need these in order to construct the spline. So we have here that c0 double prime of x is equal to 6 minus 12x, c1 double prime of x is equal to 6x minus 2, c2 double prime of x is equal to 6x minus 4, and c3 double prime of x is equal to 12x minus 6. So now we're in a position where we can write down the general form for our spline. So we'll have here then that s of x has two different ranges here. So from 0 to 1 we'll have one form and from 1 to 2 we'll have a different form. So in the most general case then from 0 to 1 we could write down that it would be some combination of c0 of x, c1 of x, c2 of x and c3 of x. And for 1 to 2, we'll use the same basis functions, but because these functions have nice properties from 0 to 1, we'll shift them over by 1 so that they have the nice properties of 1 and 2 instead. So we'll have c0 of x minus 1, c1 of x minus 1, c2 of x minus 1, and c3 of x minus 1. So we can now look at some simplifications that we can get uh, due to the constraints that we have. And so let's first look at making our spline satisfy the data points that we're given. So if we look now at x equals 0, then we know that of these four functions, only c3 achieves a non-zero value there. And therefore, the coefficient on front, in front of c3 has to be 0. Otherwise, our spline would have a non-zero value here. So we can immediately eliminate the C3 term. Similarly, because our, over this range, our cubic has to reach a value of 0 at x equal 1, we know that this C0 has to also vanish. Now let's look at the range from 1 to 2. So here, we know that our function has to reach a value of, of 0 at x equal 1. And that therefore tells us this C3 also has to vanish. And we require that our spline reaches a value of 1, x equal 2. And that would therefore tell us that we have to have a coefficient of 1 in front of this C0 term. So that's all we can say just using the function values. And now let's move on to the derivatives. So we require that our spline has a continuous first derivative, x equal 1. And if we look over this range from 0 to 1, then we see that the only function that gives us any contribution to the derivative is c1. So 
Now let's look at the range from 1 to 2. And the only, on, the only function that gives us a contribution is C2. So that tells us then that we must have that C1 and C2 actually have the same coefficient in front of them. So that's all that we can do through basic considerations. And to proceed from here, we'll have to do some algebra. And so we'll introduce now some parameters in front of these different basis functions. So we have alpha in front of the C1 and beta in front of the C2 and gamma in front of the C1. And because of this equality, we know that there's also an alpha in front of the C2. So we'll now look at matching the second derivative at x equal 1. And using our functions here, we can show that this is equal to 4 alpha plus 2 beta is equal to 6 minus 4 alpha minus 2 gamma. And so that's all of the usual spline conditions that we have. But we're still missing two conditions that give us a unique solution. And so here we're going to look at constructing a natural spline where we enforce that the second derivative of the spline vanishes at the two endpoints. So suppose now that we look at enforcing that s double prime of 0 is equal to 0, then that gives us that 0 is equal to minus 2 alpha minus 4 beta. And if we look at enforcing that s double prime at 2 is equal to 0, then that gives us that 0 is equal to minus 6 plus 4 gamma plus 2 alpha. So now we've got three equations to consider. Equation 1, equation 2, and equation 3. And equation 2 is the easiest to deal with. So from 2, we know that beta is equal to minus alpha over 2. And we can now substitute this into equation 1. And so that will allow us to eliminate beta from equation 1. And so we'll therefore get then that 3 alpha is equal to 6 minus 4 alpha minus 2 gamma. And we can rearrange this to get then that 7 alpha plus 2 gamma is equal to 6. And so now we've got two equations for alpha and gamma, this one, and then also equation 3 that we haven't used so far. And so we can solve these then to find that alpha is equal to a half, gamma is equal to 5 fourths, and from our previous expression then, beta is equal to minus a quarter. And that then gives us now our general solution for our spline. We have then the s of x is equal to a half c1 of x minus a quarter of c2 of x over this range from x is 0 up to 1. And we have then c0 of x minus 1 plus 5 fourths c1 of x minus 1 plus a half c2 of x minus 1 for the case when x is between 1 and 2. So that then gives us now our complete unique solution. And we'll now take a look at this on the computer and compare how it works in relation to these data points. Let's now return to GNU plot and take a look at our calculated spline. And I'm first going to create a small data file called PTS that contains the three data points that our spline should go through. 0, 0, 1, 0, and 2, 1. And I'm now going to plot these three 
data points over the range from 0 to 2, and I'm going to slightly pad the axes. And so we see here our three, our three data points. And so we now want to verify that our calculated spline will go through these data points. And so I'm now going to define the function s of x to match our calculated spline. So we need to specify a different form for x less than 1 and for x greater than 1. And so this can be done in GNUplot with the switch operator. So we'll first specify the condition, and now we'll specify the form for x less than 1. And we'll then use a colon to switch into the form for x greater than 1. And with our function s defined now, we can overlay it on, on top of our data points. And we see here that the resulting curve does exactly what we would expect. It maintains a high level of smoothness throughout the entire plot, maintaining first derivatives and also second derivatives and it also goes through the three data points. We can also see that at the ends of the interval, at 0 and, and at 2, the spline actually strains up and has no curvature. And this is really through setting our natural spline conditions, where we enforce that S double prime would vanish at these two endpoints. And here, I'm actually showing the spline a little bit beyond its region of validity, but in, in practice, if we had more intervals, then we would set additional cubics in, in those intervals as well.